Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church, Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. Uh, before jumping into my sermon, I think it is important to have a little explanation of that first reading with all those animals cut in half, <laughs> the, in, the ensuing trance, the smoking brazier, the flaming torch passing between the halves of the sacrifices, and then God making a covenant with Abram prior to God's changing Abram's name to Abraham. Um, in our in our tradition, is a very important story. It's called the story of the Abrahamic Covenant. It was important because it meant that God would always account or reckon or impute Abram's faith or trust in God as God and Abram always being all right with one another. God and Abram are tight. As the tradition continues on, there are other covenants that God made. The rainbow and the cloud covenant made with Noah. The covenant of the heart, which is expressed in one of my favorite passages of scripture, the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. And the covenant that is actually Jesus. Jesus is the covenant, the Christ. It's a, about a covenant that's made with all, not just with one person. But all of these covenants are about God's declaring that you and I and everybody are all right, are tight with God, with one another. No matter what we've done or what we'll do, God's grace trumps. And in that grace, that trumping, overwhelming grace, you and I get the strength and the wisdom to do what God wants us to do with our lives. I have a close friend who uh, carries on her iPhone a photograph of a particular page from Bruce Wilkinson's little volume, The Prayer of Jabez, Breaking Through to Blessed Life. And this particular page notes that each of us is expected to attempt something so large God expects you and me to attempt something that's low, so large that failure is guaranteed unless we factor in God, unless God steps in. This is exactly what God called Abram to do, to be the father of many nations. And God made this call when Abram was over a hundred years old. And his wife, Sarah, was also beyond childbearing years. And yet, Abram believed God. And this call, guaranteed to fail unless you factor in God. Abram believed God and God imputed, reckoned, accounted Abram's trust as righteousness, which is the Bible word, the churchy word for being all right with God, being tight with God, righteousness. Now, these calls from God, according to Bruce Wilkinson, and I believe he's right, just always keep Abram in mind throughout this sermon. These calls from God must, one, go against common sense, two, must contradict your previous life experience, three, seem to disregard your feelings, training, and need for security, and finally, sets you up to look like a fool and a loser. <laughs> Yet this is how God treats the people God loves. Continue to think of Abram and Jesus. The covenant God makes with us through Christ is for everyone, not just special people like Abram and Jesus, everyone. And we and God are all right with one another 
and with God no matter how many failures we have. My friends, that's what grace is about. And don't let any religious person try to teach you that you have to earn or that you could even possibly earn God's love. It's yours in the full right now. Let me go at this a different way. A parishioner once sent a couple to me to talk over the difficulties that they were having in their marriage. That couple and I explored every wrinkle that they were trying to iron out. They had a lot of difficulties. We probed into areas of their relationship where each partner might be making choices out of their false self and where each partner was making choices out of their true self. Um, And it occurred to me at nine, and I'll parenthetically put it in here, um, the way I talked with this couple, I actually learned in a relationship crisis of my own. Um, When I was a student in law school, um, I heard this inaudible voice ask me a question, and I answered the question, and then we had this conversation. And I left law school in the middle of a uniform commercial code exam. And I was very excited about this breakthrough in my life. And I went to talk, to call this woman, um, with whom I celebrated 42 years of marriage last week. But this was before we married. 42 years of uninterrupted bliss. But I called this particular person and I said, you won't believe what just happened. I left law school and I am so happy. And she was not. And we went for 20 hours into premarital counseling, which taught me what I was doing with this couple in my office here at All Saints. So we explored where, question, where choice has been made from the false self, from the true self, how choice has been made from fear versus love. Um, and they engaged me so openly and with such hope and faith uh, that at the end of the session, one of them said, well, our friend was right. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, our friend who sent us to talk with you said that if we came for a conversation with you, it would be an experience of non-judgment day. Now that has kept reverberating in my mind because you see, life with God is non-judgment day. This morning's prayer that collects or telegraphs the theme of the appointed lessons notes that God's glory is always to have mercy. That notion about God has been one of the banners of my life that really played a significant role in my becoming a member of this church and becoming a priest. Jesus says, God desires compassion, not sacrifice. Go learn what that means. God's glory is always to have mercy. No more sacrifices of animals and no more understanding of Jesus' story as God sacrificing him. The way the prayer book has us begin every worship service during the entire season of Lent is, bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. You said that to me when we started this liturgy, and I responded to you, God's mercy endures forever. So everything we say and do during Lent is framed in God's enduring mercy for you and me. With God, it's non-judgment day. Now, the poet Jane Hirschfield has uh, been appointed, I think, by the Holy Spirit to be my poet for Lent. I'm reading her every day. And she has a stanza in one of her poems that reads, Wrong solitude vinegars the soul. Right solitude oils the soul. You could just as easily say that wrong religion vinegars the soul, where healthy religion 
oils the soul. You could say the false self and all its delusions vinegars the soul, where your true self oils it. Sacrificial understandings of life vinegar the soul. Compassionate understandings of life oil the soul. Fear and negativity vinegar the soul, where love and its practices oil the soul. Whether we are in those moments in life this morning in which we feel like our soul is being oiled, or whether we are in those moments this morning where our soul is being vinegared, in those times when you're calling, when your community discerned calling has you in a place that goes against common sense, that contradicts your previous life experience, that seems to disregard your feelings, training, and need for security, and finally sets you up to look like a fool and a loser. It is so, so, so important to remember that God is always, always, always sending you mercy and compassion without interruption and without condition. And without qualification, God is always wanting you to know that you and God are all right. That is what being in right relationship with God is. And I love this morning's gospel statement of God's consistency about enfolding you and me with mercy. Here the religious authorities are coming to Jesus to try to scare him, scare him out of town. Jesus, you need to get out of town and fast. Herod is trying to kill you. Jesus replied, you go tell that fox that I'm staying on message. I'm staying on course. I will not be deterred. No matter how much fear Herod tries to stir up in my soul and those about me, I'm going to do what I've always done. And that is cast out devils, an old biblical word for taking away the obstructions between people and God's love, and healing people. And I'm going to continue saying to everyone that I am like God, God who is like a mother hen who wants to gather her babies under her wing. You see, my friends, God's only and forever pattern is bringing something good out of nothing calling into existence what does not yet exist. These are Christian words for resurrection, for grace. All three concepts point to the same thing, in that God brings the dead to life and calls into being what does not exist. You could call that God's primary job description, grace. God is always on the job, and no matter how much we fail at helping God's project, it is non-judgment day. We are reckoned as being in right relationship with God. Last Last month, one of my best friends who lives in another state, he and I went a while without emailing one another, and then he, I'm learning this word, pinged me, and ask for verification on a plan that he and I are making. And I felt so negative and self-blaming and scared about our friendship because I had not written. I wrote this email and apologized and gave all my excuses. And then I received one of the most grace-filled emails I have ever received. My friend Stu wrote, Never, ever a need to apologize, my friend. Our bond was perfected in a past life. And then the gospel word that he, a Jew and a practicing Buddhist, gave to me. He said, I never impute anything but the best to your absence or presence. That was an email from God. 
Just imagine God sending you a message. I never impute anything but the best to your absence and presence. So this is how you and I are called to treat one another the way God treats us. This is the life of grace to which you and I are called. And one of the most important things I can tell you all about God is that there is with God always a non-judgment day. God forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. There are many times for accountability, yes. There are many times that we need to be transformed, yes. There are many times where we need to turn around and go in the opposite direction, yes. But condemning-oriented judgment, no. God has accounted all of our struggling faith as righteousness, and we're set right and tight with God. So you and I are called to live a life of great risk. Only live your life only in a way that it, the only way it makes sense is when you factor in God. That's the life of great risk and faith. And then a life of great grace where you're imputing nothing but the best to one another. Now I must close by saying something about James Walker. Today we're celebrating the fact that 30 years ago on this day in Lent, James Walker came to become our organist choir master. Um, I've been doing my kind of work for more than 40 years now and um, I have had four great, brilliant organist choir masters with whom I've worked. And I've met more with James than any of the others combined. James and I meet every week to talk over what we're going to sing, what the choirs are going to sing, what the emphasis is going to be in the liturgy, etc. We've had a marvelous relationship which will continue now for 30 more years. <laughs> and we've had to bump heads with one another from time to time, not always being in agreement, but always deepening the durability of our relationship. And it's because he has been willing to express in his being this business of risk and grace, to be called into living a life that doesn't make sense until you factor in God. And then to know that that faith has been imputed to him as being in good relationship with God and that he can extend that grace to others. I'm a grateful man for the risk and grace of James Walker, of you, of Jesus, and of God. Amen.